So, uh, so welcome. Uh, we're going to be presenting, uh, writing award-winning PowerShell functions and script modules in here today. And I was going to present this at a SQL Saturday in Nashville earlier this year, and there was ice, so I didn't make it up there. But I posted it on Reddit, and you know how you have a lot of people, you get a lot of uh, comments from jerks, so I'll just call them jerks on Reddit. And one guy said, well, you didn't say it was a good award. It could be the worst uh, script, the worst award. So, uh, but you won't, hopefully this will pre prevent you from getting the worst award. And I'll tell you a little bit about me. You're not here to learn about me, but who in the room does not know who I am? Okay, good. I think I've done my job of branding them pretty well. So I'm Mike F. Robbins. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I used to be a PowerShell MVP. Now I'm a Cloud and Data Center Management MVP. We all got rolled up. So uh, like Kirk next door, he's a, he's a Cloud and Data Center Management MVP also. As I previously said, I run the Mississippi PowerShell user group along with Ron Edwards. And I told you guys already that I won the advanced category in the scripting games in 2013. Well, Ron Edwards, the co-founder of my user group, won the advanced category in 2012. So we're the only user group with back-to-back -back winners of the uh, scripting games, and when Ron won it, Ed Wilson was still running it. I've authored or co-authored a number of books. There's links in the slide deck, and all this is on GitHub already. And the, the USB keys that we gave out, the Windows PowerShell TFM 4th Edition, is this book here that me and Jason Helmet co-authored. It's got the full version on there. I already mentioned about the scripting games. You can learn more about me at MikeFRobbins.com. You're, you're not here to learn about me, but one thing I will tell you about my blog is I've been blogging about PowerShell since 2009. So I have over 500 blog articles, and I put all my code on GitHub. Now I started doing that. And what I do, I won't go back and update the blog articles, but I'll update it on GitHub until you go out there and get the latest version. And just to give you an idea of the type of content I have, I get over like 600,000 hits a year. And one of the reasons I do that, I mean, I'm selfish. I do it for myself. I can't remember how I did something later down the road. Uh, but then also, if you guys would enjoy the content, then it's out there. One thing also, I get a lot of peer reviews because I will post it on Reddit. And you get a lot of trolls out there that, but listen to what they have to say. Because like one of my videos I put on YouTube, I got some great feedback. And then one guy comes along and says, hey, it would be great if you would stop bumping the mic. And I was like, what a jerk, you know. But then I went back and listened to the video, and he was right. So listen to people. And if you guys saw Lee Daly, he won one of the awards yesterday. And I don't know Lee Daly, but he has commented on some of my posts on Reddit. Because a few weeks ago, I posted some code where... Uh, I was splitting a path, and I did it with a regular expression. And I just wrote the code. I never even thought about it. And Lee said, hey, uh, is there any reason you're not using split path? And no, I just never thought about it. So I went and updated the code and gave him credit for it. So that's the sort of things I don't have. In, I'm the advanced person at work. And all those, I have some other guys that write some PowerShell, and I will let them review my code. I generally don't, they wouldn't catch something like that is what I'm getting at. So if you want peer reviews, it's a great way to get it by blogging your code. Okay, we're going to skip through some of this. I know all you guys are either an IT pro or developer or somewhere in between. When I tell the IT, the IT pros in my shop say, you're not an IT pro, you're a developer. And then I go over to the, uh, to the de developers and they say, oh, you're not a real developer. <laughs> so I'm somewhere in between. I'm sure you guys are too. Uh, so who's using unit testing today? Like Pester? Okay, good. What about source control? Great. I would say out of those two, the source control is more important than the unit testing. Uh, and I, that gives me an idea how advanced you are, because if you're using both those, then you're, you're more advanced. But if you're not, then you're less advanced, is what I would say. Because if you start writing code that you value, you're going to put it in source control. Uh, the unit testing. It helps. It can cut down on the time. Who's using VS Code today, Visual Studio Code? Awesome. And I'm kind of like this guy up front here. I'm like this. You know, I use the best tool for the job at the point in time. I won't be using VS Code today in this session. I'll show it a little bit. I've, I've been using it for about a year now, pretty heavily. 
It's the, I generally don't open up the ISC, but there's a couple of features in the ISC. Since I've been using it for about, the ISC for about eight years, I feel a lot more comfortable up here in front of 100 people uh, using the ISC. And let me just say this. So Visual Studio Code is nothing like Visual Studio. Visual Studio Code is free. That's a misconception I've heard. It is very lightweight. It's almost like using Notepad. It's that light. Where if you install Visual Studio on your machine, it's very heavy and bloated. And if you take the defaults, it installs SQL Server and everything but the kitchen sink. So anytime I install Visual Studio, I install it on a VM because I don't want all that garbage on my machine. And I use Visual Studio so infrequently, I don't want, I don't want the slowdown. So I assume that if you're not using VS Code, you're using the ISC. And PowerShell Studio is another option. I write my GUIs in that, but I, I typically do not use that on a day-to-day -day basis. Who is using PowerShell Core? Okay, good. And one thing about PowerShell Core, there's actually some notes in the slide deck. I don't see the notes, so uh, if you want to see the notes, just download the PowerPoint. I don't think they're in the PDF copy that I uploaded. PowerShell Core is not a replacement for Windows PowerShell. It installs side by side on a Windows system. And everything is totally separate. Even if you update your help in Windows PowerShell, you don't have the updates in PowerShell Core. You have to update it there too. Now there's a module you can install to, uh, to put the C program files Windows PowerShell module path in your, uh, in your PS module path for PowerShell Core. And I know that sounds confusing. But what it does, it allows you to use your Windows PowerShell modules and PS Core. It just gives you a pointer, and I'll show that here in a minute. How many PowerShell experts do we have in the room? See, I'm great. We have one. So I invited Joel Bennett. He's not here to come heckle my session, and also Jason Helmick. Uh, so I did Windows updates this morning. Two reasons. Uh, Don Jones told me not to do them, so I did them. Uh, <laughs> And they were available, so I said I'll head off the problem and do it. But that's the benefit of source code. I told this story a few minutes ago. I'll, I'll be brief. So I committed my code to GitHub because if I host up my machine, I could say, hey, has somebody in the audience got a machine I can present on? And I could just pull down my code and present. So this is what you want to try to avoid. This is the reason you're here in this session. You don't want to write code and six months later you're ready to gouge your eyes out. So the content we're going to cover, I'm going to go through this real quick. I had it up earlier. It's right off the abstract of the synopsis. I always like to make sure you're in the right session. So demo time. I will, uh, I'll be happy to follow up with you on that. I don't have any test code to test that with. Okay. And dy dynamic parameters, I actually rarely use dynamic parameters. Let, let me ask the, how many people in the audience use dynamic parameters? Okay. Yeah, if uh, MikeFRobbins at gmail.com. Okay. I mean, you pretty much find me MikeFRobbins anywhere. I sign up for everything. I even signed up for like MySpace and all this sort of stuff I'll never use, just so I get the brand. So anytime you steal code from somebody, just like this code I stole here, give the person credit for it. Thomas Rayner, he's, uh, he said he stole it for somebody and couldn't remember who he stole it from. So what that does, I'm just throwing an error in case I run the entire script. I used to use break, but what I found, break doesn't always break. Break's designed to break out of a loop. So I've had some scenarios where it didn't break, and I started using start sleep so I would catch it in time. And then I saw him present this. And I decided to steal it. So I think I've already zoomed in to 125%. I saw a tweet yesterday from Michael Bender about people with, that are colorblind set the, the errors to, uh, to yellow. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I normally set them to green anyway because we are going to have some errors in this session. And this is just prep for the session. 
I've already imported this module. I have a Mr. Toolkit module that's in my, uh, in my GitHub rep repository also. Just want to prove to you I'm not pulling your leg. I did Windows updates today. <laughs> if I say it, hey, you can bet you it's fact because I can't remember who I tell a story to, so I always tell the same story so I don't have to worry about remembering what I said. Or it's at least what I believe at that point in time. Because what's correct changes just like with your code and so now we got yellow error messages. We are going to skip a lot of this because I can tell that uh, I'm going to have a lot less time than I thought I was going to have. Uh, we're on Windows 10 17.09 with PowerShell 5.1 which ships in box with that version. We've got Power, PowerShell Core 6.02 also installed. Let's jump back to the PowerPoint slide real quick. I normally don't jump around but this is something new. So I'll see how it goes. So one thing I find people doing is uh, they don't think before they write code. They have no idea what they're trying to accomplish. And they don't have a plan, so they plan to fail. So, and learning is not equal searching the internet. So what I would say, that I search the internet all the time. I download code all the time. But what I do when I download it, I want to know how it works. And that's the reason I like script modules so much is yes, you can put some DLLs in there, but generally the code I download doesn't have DLLs because I don't want to bring black boxes into my corporation. So if you're still in or borrowing code, then just give the person credit for it and think about what problem are you trying to solve before you start and don't reinvent the wheel. So has somebody else already rent the code you could contribute to, maybe you could add functionality to? And one thing I'll say with that is, uh, so if you go out to GitHub, and I'm a big believer, I don't use like backticks for line continuation. But some people do, they like their parameters lined up. And if I'm con contributing to somebody else's repository, I'm gonna follow their guidelines. But I'm not gonna write my code that way when it's my code. The worst thing you can do is go contribute to somebody's GitHub repo and reformat all their code and say, hey, look, I did this great thing for you. I reformatted your code the way I like it, you know. Yeah, that, that's not gonna get accepted. So uh, don't overcomplicate things. Keep it super simple. And don't write code that's unnecessary. A lot of people say, well, it's not hurting anything. Well, it does add complexity. So the thought process, most of you guys in here should know a lot of what I'm gonna cover in this talk. talk. But for some reason, as humans, we have a problem doing the things we know we should do. And I was talking to Mark Manassi about this last night, and he's presenting right now, by the way, and it's his last presentation before he retires. Uh, he recommended a book on this, and I, I don't have the book to reference. Anyway, avoid aliases and positional parameters in any code that you share, even if it's a one-liner. Now, typically the rule is to avoid them in functions and and scripts. If you open up the console, you type out some code and you close it out and it's gone, who cares what you typed in there? Now, I say it's gone, but it's always gonna be there because of PS read lines, so you can go find what you typed in, but nobody cares about that. Readability, and I've been there. Uh, when I was writing my chapter in the PowerShell Deep Dives book, Jeff Hicks told me, I mean, I had great code, but it was all left justified. And he's like, go put some spaces in and format your code and make it look better. And I'm like, it looks fine to me. You know? <laughs> so uh, Jeff, is, Jeff Hicks has been a good mentor to me. He's left me some comments on my blog article that's really, that's really helped me. You know? So uh, I appreciate that. Don't write, and I mentioned this already, don't write unnecessary code. Um, I had somebody once upon a time tell me like in the pipeline that the order you put your commands in didn't matter and that couldn't be further from the truth because if you select some properties from the pipeline and then you pipe it to where object, those properties may not exist anymore. And then just like piping a format table or format list, you, you don't want that in the middle of your command. So order does matter. One thing I would say with that, and it's kind of unrelated to this, but related to what I just said, is don't put sort object and format table in your code unless you have to because it does slow your code way down. Because, and it makes it where it's not reusable. 
and we'll cover that more later. So attention to detail goes a long way when writing code and power, any kind of code and PowerShell is no exception. One thing I'll say with that, I kind of have a problem with this, that I write a function and I'll spend to the end of time on that function because I can always find something, oh, I could do this better and that better and something else. So one thing I would caution you is don't do that. Uh, you have to have a little bit of a I don't care attitude and set a date, set a time that you're gonna be done. And Jeffrey Snover, he always says to ship is to choose. So have a V1 and if you wanna go back and add something, then have a, that'll be a V2 feature. And maybe you release it and you put that in a to-do section that, hey, I'm gonna do this before somebody comes out and say, oh, well, you didn't do this, that, and the other. But set a deadline because you need code that works, but you also want code that you can support later down the road. So clarity, and what I mean by that is, uh, is begin with the end in mind when you write something and know where, what you're trying to accomplish. And once you know what you're trying to accomplish, break it down, and these are good lessons for life I've found in general and I just apply them to PowerShell. Break what you're trying to accomplish down into manageable steps and then it seems like it's a lot a lot less difficult to figure it out. And it's no different than this demo, so it's in regions, and it was a lot smaller than coming up with an hour and 45 minute session. That last, that last item tends to be challenging for a lot of groups because we forget the attention to detail. Yes, definitely, I have problems. Big picture and, and not, not all the individual steps. You, uh, because me, I know I'll get tunnel vision and I'll be focused on exactly what I'm working on, but I don't see the big picture. Uh, so one thing with all this, ultimately doing this stuff is about bringing value to your business and bringing money in the door. And like me, I work for a healthcare company, so uh, I don't work, I'm not selling anything. And we're not a revenue generating department. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's ever heard that. So, but the good thing is, so, and I have another slide, so I won't go into that yet. Simplicity, there's power in simplicity. When you go down the road, you know, do you need pipeline support? And do you need these different things? Because what I found is when I write functions and when I add pipeline support, it seems to double the amount of code that I'm writing. And do I really need that? Now sure, it's a nice to have. So, should you write a script or function? I prefer to write something that's tool oriented and what I consider to be tool oriented is functions. And when I write functions, so module auto loading was introduced in PowerShell version three. So when I write a function, I throw it into a module and I put it in the PS module path, I don't have to worry about it from now on. I just go open up PowerShell and call it and it just works. I don't have to remember, oh, I saved that script over here, over there, over somewhere else. It's also easier, and I know that you can put scripts in the PowerShell gallery, but I don't do that. I ignore that because I disagree with that. Uh, but you can have an internal NuGet repository or the PowerShell gallery, and it makes your code a lot easier to share. So the other thing is, what I don't do in my functions, I don't put proprietary data. And what I mean by that, I don't put credentials, I don't put server names, I don't put so on. Uh, because it makes it easier to open source. And a lot of people have trouble getting their company to help them open source code, but the company is really shooting themselves in the foot because you will write better code if you share it publicly. You're not gonna write something that's quick and dirty. And you'll also get peer reviews. So if it's something generic that's not, if like me, since we're not a revenue generating department, I'm not giving away anything that is gonna cost our company any money. Now then what I do, I write caller scripts and I put the proprietary data in the caller scripts and I don't share those with anybody outside my company. And those are real simple. That they're generally real simple. They can get more complicated, but I just call the individual pieces, the individual functions. You also get ideas and suggestions when you share your code and you'll get contributions. Maybe you have a problem you don't know you have or maybe 
there's some functionality that somebody else needs and they may add the functionality that may benefit you. And ultimately, it's about writing better code. You can get better code by, by not doing anything other than sharing your code. Okay, so if you don't know what a function is, you might be at the wrong conference. Yeah. So I know that's, that may be, seem a little mean, but uh, that's why I have a smiley face there that, hey, if you don't know what a function is, then we're, we're, you know, we welcome you here and we'll teach you what it is. So what's a function? It's a list of commands or instructions that are packaged as one unit. It performs a specific task. So a PowerShell function should retrieve data, process data, or output data. It should do one of those things and not all those things. So if you need it to do all those things, you would write a function to do each one of those, and then you would write a script, and you would call those three functions. And it makes your, just like I was talking about, it makes your code more modular. It makes it like Lego pieces. When I was a kid, I loved, loved to play with Lego, and that's why PowerShell is a really good fit for me. So the naming, this should be a pretty much a review for everyone here, but just in case, I'm not gonna make any assumptions. Pascal case name, which is like a proper case name. Capitalize the first letter of the verb, all terms in the noun. Use an approved verb, otherwise you're gonna get a warning when you import your module. I'm gonna show you that here in just a second. So use a singular noun. And with a singular noun, oh, well that, that's not nouns, okay. Prefix the noun. So I, I performed a technical edit on a book, on a SQL book for PowerShell. And I was brought in late because the previous person that was doing that job quit. It's one of the few technical edits I've ever got paid for because they wanted it done really quick. One day into the project, I was like, yeah, uh, I'm gonna quit. <laughs> because uh, the guy that was writing the book, he had written the whole book without using verb dash noun. And his, his deal was that he there would be collisions with other commands. And I was like, no, that's not how you do it. So uh, I'm like, you're, you're not a PowerShell guy and the community won't hold you accountable, but it, it'll make me look really bad and I'll be held accountable by the community. So I said, yeah, I'll just have to quit. You can, you can reform or I'll quit. So I think the previous guy told him that and he actually did quit. Uh, so he did reform and wrote it properly. So sometimes on this stuff, you have to stand your ground, you know, and don't do, do it the right way or don't do it at all. So when you prefix your noun, so what I do, you could write something like get version, and if you wrote get version, you're gonna get a collision somewhere. And you could write get PS version for, for getting the PowerShell version. And you're probably gonna get a collision there. I would never prefix with PS because the PowerShell team may use that. So, and I, as I was saying earlier, my, my initials are MR for Mike Robbins, so it's Mr. So you'll get, get Mr. PS version or get Mr. version, something like that. So all my modules, all my commands are mist, get Mr., set Mr., and so on. And I know, hey, there's other, there's other people that I may get collisions, but you can import the module with the prefix parameter and you can prefix those commands. So that's pretty easy to avoid. So an example, approve verb, prefix singular noun. Okay, let's jump back to the demo. And several of these regions were just to remind me to go to the PowerPoints. Okay. So how do you think you create a new module? If you search, you, you would think that uh, with PowerShell that would be pretty simplistic and it would be a new module, right? A new script module. Well, you would, you would be wrong. Because new module creates a dynamic module in memory. And I'm gonna use it here simply to show you the warning. So that's the warning there that you would see if you used unapproved verbs. There's a list of verbs on the web. I've got a link to it here. But for the most up-to-date list, run get verb from within PowerShell. I'm gonna run it. Now one thing I will tell you Let's just run get verb. So in PowerShell core, get verb returns a different type of object and it returns two new columns 
and it has a group parameter for just filtering, filtering by group. And on top of that, there's two new verbs, build and deploy. So the moral of the story here is, if you want to make sure your code is compatible with PowerShell Core and Windows PowerShell, you have to test in both because there's things that work in PowerShell Core that don't work in Windows PowerShell and vice versa. I've been running all my code in both just to see what didn't work. And I haven't found a lot because I don't use, I don't, generally don't use WMI unless I'm doing like DSC and DSC doesn't work in PowerShell Core currently. So I've talked about part of this already. Let me just run these commands real quick so my demo won't fail. So I talked about get, getting collisions and get version, get PS version. And then I would run, I would uh, create it as get Mr. Version. This is like the simplest function you would ever write. I try to keep my code simple when I do demos because a lot of times you can't see the forest for the trees when it gets really complicated. So I'm just gonna query the function PS drive. And you can see the functions on there. They're not part of a module. Well, there is one, well, there's one already loaded on there that's part of a module, part of my Mr. Toolkit module. And that's that Mr. Toolkit's available on GitHub and in the PowerShell gallery. The latest code is on GitHub. So I'm gonna remove those. And a lot of people, what they'll do is close out PowerShell and reopen it because it's not part of a module. To get rid of those, you can simply just delete them off the function PS drive and you'll notice that they're gone. Now the one that we had the unapproved verb for still exists. So with it, anytime you have a module, I mean, this is, this is pretty simple here, but you would just remove the module, which it sounds like it deletes it off disk or something, but it doesn't. I call it unload the module because it unloads it out of memory. And then if we check for it, you would see that it doesn't exist. There's a lot of commands in here. So I, I wasted a lot of time on my demos this year because I had the bright idea since I've been writing books on uh, Lean Pub, I said, I'll write all my sessions as a chapter in a book and give it to everybody. Well, I guess about halfway into that project, I figured out that there's no way I can finish this and get my demo ready too. So I abandoned that and I may do that at some point in the future, you know. But what I did is I took the book and I cut and paste out of it and then reformatted everything in here. So if you read through this, you're gonna get the context of the book. All except for the stuff I updated this morning right before the demo. And I did that also because Don told me not to do it. <laughs> so I guess I'll have to start covering up this mic when I say that sort of stuff. Um, so all the text says exactly what I've told you. Now dot sourcing functions, so one thing I was told is you could go a long time and not understand the function PS drive or dot sourcing functions and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure all of us probably know what dot sourcing is, but just in case you don't, we're gonna create a new function in a PS1 file. And we're gonna add some code. I don't like typing, to be honest with you. That's why I like tabbed expansion. And also, I'm gonna inject code into my files so that I don't have to type. And this is what, one of the reasons I'm using IC steroids, and I know other products do this too, but I can just say yes, and hey, it refreshes. So the problem, when you run a script, you could go a long time also without knowing this, but I've ran the script. I call the function in the script. So we got an error, it doesn't exist. And then how many people know why I got this error? Okay, good, good. See, that's why I never assume anything because I've presented before and a lot of times people say, oh, well, that was too easy. And a lot of people say, well, that was really advanced. So I have a hard time after working with PowerShell for a long time judging what I should be teaching because I'm like, oh, that's super easy. And somebody else is like, well, that's really advanced. So the problem is, is the function is in the PS1 file. And what it does by calling the script up here, it loads it into the script scope. 
So when the script exits, it, it deletes the function so it no longer exists on the function PS drive. It actually never put it on the function PS drive because all those are loaded in the global scope. So what dot sourcing is, and I could look at the function PS drive and we would also get an error there. But if I query the, the uh, well that, that's the same command I just ran. If I dot source the function, so there's a space between these dots and all that is, it's a little confusing looking, but it's a relative path. So it's dot space and then the path to the uh, PS1 file. So if I run that, and just to show you, I want to make sure I didn't run these, I put comments, but I could, I could dot source the fu fully qualified path and there is a space in there, or I could use the variable has the C demo in, in it. So I could use a variable. So that dot sources it, and what dot sourcing does, it loads it into the global scope, so even when the script exits, it still, it loads it on the function PS drive and it still exists. So now you can see SR71 is the name of my computer. So. And I keep saying I'm gonna rename it to the name of the guy in Star Wars, the, uh, I forget his name, uh, Finn, whatever his like, NC whatever name is. There you go. Too bad I don't have any more prizes. Uh, so you'll notice it doesn't exist in a module. Now this is a great way to test your functions. And what you want to do when you're testing your functions, don't test them in the ISC or even VS Code. Test them at the console. And have you ever had the problem, well, it doesn't work on other machines, but it works on my machine. <laughs> uh, Use the no profile option. So when you call PowerShell.exe or the PowerShell core executable, which I can never remember the name of that thing, uh, there's a no profile option to make sure you're not using a profile. That when you're writing functions, you can always also use a require statement at the top. And you can specify the PowerShell version that it requires. And you can also specify the modules that are required because maybe you're using a module that doesn't exist on that target computer. All that information is in here. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that function from the function PS drive. We'll double check, make sure it's gone, it is gone. So variables. Okay, so don't, don't use static values. <laughs> use variables and parameters. Hungarian notation. The fastest way to find out that if somebody knows PowerShell or not is to see how they, if they're using Hungarian notation. And I have seen people, and I won't mention any names, but on really important mailing list who are experts in the industry, but they're not PowerShell experts. And they have emailed code wanting help with it with Hungarian notation. Because one of the problems we have in the industry is somebody, they'll be a SQL expert or they'll be an Active Directory expert. SQL is a good example because they write code too. And then they'll think just because they know Transact SQL that they know PowerShell. Well, we probably all know that's not the case because although I can write some basic transact SQL, it's probably not the best practices because I don't do it every day. And even, uh, so years ago I took a VB script class and I took a Windows scripting host and I actually took a, a VB.net class. And this has been like more than 10 years ago. I've been at the same company over 12 years. I still have some of my VB.net code running in production today that I wrote back then that is mission critical. So, and I won't go into detail about it, but I probably, what I probably need to do the next time it breaks is I need to use PowerShell Studio and I just need to rewrite a GUI on top of PowerShell to do that process because that's what I know. A lot of times with SQL, I'll even suck the data out of SQL Server and then do some, uh, some sort of translation or some sort of... Uh, manipulation with the data and then I'll stick it back in SQL just cause I know how to do it in PowerShell but I don't know how to do it in SQL. 
Okay, that's Hungarian notation if you didn't know what it was. It's typing your variables with string or int or so on. And since PowerShell is a typed language, you, may, you, can, uh, you don't need to name it the type of object that it is. If you want to know the type of object, you just pipe to get member. You know, it's really easy to find out the type of object. So it should be out file and not str out file. Use a meaningful name for your variables. It'll make troubleshooting a lot easier. So don't reuse variables, and I'm guilty of this. I have a good example, a great example, that I wrote some code, and I used a variable. And then later in the script, I didn't need that variable anymore, so I reused the name. And it worked great. And then six months later, and let's see. I have a slide on that I want to share now. Why it's, okay, it's the next slide. Why it's in context. So, anyway, this is a response to me. I was looking for help. A great place to find help is on PowerShell.org on the forums. Even as an MVP, hey, I don't know everything. I ask for help. And uh, I believe in staying humbled. But it's kind of funny that uh, Dave Wyatt, if you don't know who Dave is, he's a great guy. He, uh, he's, like, he's like a Jedi, <laughs> like a PowerShell Jedi. He's always got the answer, and it's always the right answer. Uh, if you've been on the PowerShell forums, I'm sure you've run into him. But he tells me that, hey, I was using VM, and he would use VM and VM object instead of using VM twice because you can't tell what different type of thingies are in your variables. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, so a lot of what I'm covering in this session is pitfalls that I've had or things that's been difficult for me to learn. I want to make a quick comment. When you sure. write a script, really think about the course staff that have to read it after. Exactly. Because it's just going to be you, too, and then like you said, you come back six months so, later and you forget. Yep. Six months later, it seemed like a great idea on day one. It worked perfect. Six months later, I'm like, who wrote this? Definitely. Okay, parameter naming. So try to try to design your parameters like the built-in command. It's like computer name, and it's computer, and then up. So C is an uppercase, and the N is an uppercase. Try to and use the com the commandlets that like ship with Windows, even if Microsoft writes them. And I'll I'll pick on the Azure commandlets. Do not model your commands after the Azure commandlets. Whatever you do, and I probably don't have to say anything else about that. You probably know exactly what I'm talking about. So anything but the Azure commandlets, you'll probably be okay. But the real built-in ones that ship with Windows that was written by the PowerShell team are probably a good example to model your. Uh, parameters and your commandlets in general off of. Plural parameter names. So a lot of people have trouble like, I'm going to query multiple, potentially query multiple databases, and should my parameter name be database or databases? Well, there's documentation out there that says you should only use a plural name when it, when it always accepts plural values. It won't accept a single value, which is probably never. Because if you can give it multiple values, you can, you can probably give it one. So I never use plural names. To me, it's more standardized. So avoid them. So it, if, they, uh, if they can accept a single element, then, and I've already said this, if they accept a single element, they should be singular. Even if they can accept a multi-elements. Multi so Pascal case name just like so this makes it real easy because you're going to use pascal case for a lot for your uh, name of your command and for your 
parameter names. Don't use lowercase computer name. And what you want to try to do is when somebody downloads your code, you want them to feel like that most people's going to know how to use PowerShell if they're downloading your commands anyway, or at least know how to call the commands. And that way when they're using your commands and they're, they've already used things like get date and get service and get process and so on, it kind of feels like the normal commands. It's going to prevent your phone from ringing if it's internal to your company or issues on GitHub or so on that people can't figure out how to use it. And help is another thing and we'll cover that in a second. So uh, let's jump into the, pres into the demo again. We have about an hour left at this point. So I'm not using the timer, I don't need the timer. Yeah, it's getting a little warm in here. I didn't bring shorts. One time I wore shorts to, I left, uh, I live in Meridian, Mississippi, so I left home in shorts and I got to Seattle and I was freezing to death. <laughs> and, but I checked the weather on Saturday. It was colder at my house in Meridian, Mississippi than it, than it was in Seattle on Saturday. We had some unusual weather. It was 20 degrees difference in mine and my mother's house and she lives like two hours south of me. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna do exactly what I just told you. I'm actually gonna call the function right after I load it. So I've used computer name, and I've already, t I was gonna ask you why I use computer name instead of server name, host. Well, actually I didn't, uh, I've got the answer right there anyway, so it really doesn't matter. And it's about making your commands look and feel like the native ones. And if in doubt, just go query the native ones. Maybe I'm unsure. So I'll write a, hey, and. Why not use PowerShell to find out? So write a function. So should I use computer, computer name, server name, host, machine, or so on? Well, there's a few with different, different, uh, different ones, but by, by large, computer name wins. There's a few with server name. There's one with computer. So that's how I figure out how to, what, what command to use, what parameter name to use. Let's see. So let's get back to our, well, there was one more command I do want to run. So I had, I had trouble with one recently, and I, I chose the wrong one. So I used file path instead of file. But if, if you look at that, 74 commands with a path parameter and eight with a file path, and that's out of the ones I have loaded. Because earlier I had no other modules loaded when I ran through my demo at the hotel, and I had 32 commands, or maybe 33, that had a computer name parameter, and none of the other ones, they had zeros. So maybe it's that Mr. Toolkit module that I loaded that I wrote. <laughs> Somebody tweeted out a really old blog article of mine a while back, I mean, like from 2009, and I, I've got a, I'm going to archive some blog articles because I tweeted back to them and I said, whatever you do, don't do it that way. <laughs> so, of course, I can tab expand to see what the parameters are, but I prefer not to do that, so I'll just show them in. So, right now, I only have a computer name parameter because this is a function and not an advanced function. There's another way to see them and get commands, so I'll run, run it that way also. So we're about to do something really complicated. And when you don't know how to do this, it, it sounds like it's like huge. We're gonna create an advanced function. Really complicated. It's so complicated that it takes one line to do it. Commandlet binding, that turns a function into an advanced function. There's almost no reason to not turn all functions into advanced functions. Now you may have some helper functions and that's fine. And what that gives you is common parameters. So now if I'm gonna run the same commands I ran before. The only thing I've changed is add commandlet binding. So now notice I have com common parameters. And then you can see all the individual common parameters by querying it the other way. 
most of these sections now have recommended reading. So everything you ever wanted to know about PowerShell is in the help. You really don't need to buy any books. The about help topics are a great, great place to read, and what most books are, they're just the Cliff Notes versions of the help topics. Okay, so who likes to prevent resume generating events? <laughs> See, uh, as you can tell, I like, I like to little, live a little dangerous, you know, so uh, do Windows updates before presentation, update your demo. Uh, so there's no what if or confirm for those things. Anyway, we want to add what if and confirm support to our function. And the way you add that is supports should process. That's it. Very simple. And when would you add this? That's what most people have trouble knowing when to do this. They either always do it or they never do it. So if your command is going to make changes, then you would want to add what if and confirm. If you're just running something that gets something that makes no changes, there's no reason to add this. So you can see now I've got what if and confirm. And I'll just query it the other way, and they're at the very bottom. What if and confirm. So if all the, and see I said it again, so luckily all you guys have a book already. Uh, If all the commands in your function already support what if and confirm, you have nothing more to do. It's automatic. But if they don't, then you have to write additional code. I don't have a uh, demo of that code, but I'm going to tell you where to find the information. So if you go out to my blog, there's a free ebook on there. It's called Free Book on Windows PowerShell Advanced Functions. It was written by six MVPs, and I wrote one chapter in it. Jeff Hicks wrote the chapter on, on uh, confirm and what if. So you can go download that and read that chapter and it's a deep dive into that. There's also parameter validation. I wrote a chapter, June Blender wrote a chapter, Adam Bertram, uh, Francois Xavier, Bo Prox. It was an entire week of articles. And they're actually blog articles on our, all our in, individual blogs, but we compiled, Jeff compiled it as a book and then I stole it and put it on my blog. Yeah, I would definitely recommend going through there and reading that to get the details of that. So now we're gonna jump into parameter validation and while a lot of people don't consider this to be parameter validation, I use type constraints and I recommend it. And what I mean by type constraints is I'm going to type computer name as a string. So if I call it with one, param with one value for the parameter, it works fine. If I call it with two, I get an error. That's because I'm accepting one value because I've typed it as a string. The problem with this you probably don't want people to ignore the computer name parameter, but they can ignore it, not give it a value at all. It's probably not what you want. So in order to prevent that, you would use a mandatory parameter. I'm not gonna cover all the different parameter validations because there's like 50 million of them. I could do it. I could do all hour and 45 minutes on that. So now what we've done, we've we've said mandatory. And this is PowerShell 3 plus compliant code. PowerShell 2 is deprecated, so I quit writing PowerShell 2. But if you wanted it compliant with PowerShell 2, you would say equal, equal true, equal dollar sign true. Or equal dollar, you would, you would never really have to say equal dollar sign false, you would just leave mandatory out. And I think that's one of the reasons they got rid of the equal true is because if you specify it, it's on and if you don't specify it, it's off. To show you how that works, 
So now, if I don't specify anything, it prompts me. It says, hey, uh-uh, got to give it a computer name. So I could say server 01, I hit enter. All it did was return server 01. It could have did, did whatever. So the problem is, what if I want to give it more than one computer name? So now what I've done is I've actually, I'm going to allow it to have a, an array of strings. Still have the mandatory parameter. Now when I call it without the parameter, notice it says computer name zero. So I can give it multiple, I, it'll keep asking for names until I don't give it a value and press enter. So that's how you can restrict somebody to using a certain type, like an integer, or you can uh, one value versus multiple values. So one of the pitfalls is default values do not work with mandatory parameters. I see a lot of people try to make this work. It doesn't work. So I've given it a default value here, this here. You call the function, guess what? Didn't use the default value. So what you have to use, you have to use a different type of parameter validation if you want that functionality. Use validate not null or empty. So I've removed, I've removed mandatory and added validate not null or empty. There's a lot of these different ones. Uh, I've got another good example too of one I never use. You can do validate count, validate pattern, validate script. I, I should have the about help topic in here that lists all those. So now if I call it without specifying the parameter, guess what? It gives me the local computer name because the default is environment computer name and it's preferably to use environment computer name over dot or local host. It makes it a little more dynamic it, and it's considered to be a best practice. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, when you're using validate set, what would be a best practice on getting information that's locally on the box that you want to use as a set of possible parameters inside a secondary script? Would you write an upper script? Yes. What I would do is, uh, so you might be able to use. That's why I was asking about dynamic parameters, but. Yeah. What you could do, I wouldn't use validate set. I would use validate script is how I would do it. And then that way I could call the other function. And I'm going to show you validate script here in just a minute. To populate that. To populate that. But dynamic parameters may be a better fit for that. Okay, so when I do specify the uh, parameter and values, then I get the parameter and values. So you get the best of both worlds. And you also can't, if you give it a null or you give it an empty string along with the value, you'll get an error because it doesn't allow uh, nulls or empties. Validate pattern. I never use it. You can write your own better. So I've got this long regular expression of validate a file name. Who can read that? Who knows what that means? Anybody in this room? So, yeah, Manassi's talk. That's exactly right. I talked to him last night. And I'm like, all this grouping and this look ahead, and that gets confusing. So the reason I don't use it, I always like to be very specific. There's a reason I do everything I do. Okay, so somebody. Well, you showed that as an example of not, not a best practice, but will PowerShell allow it? Yes, PowerShell will allow this. Uh, the reason that, so it tells you what you specified does not match this pattern. 
Exactly. Probably nobody in this room would know what they're talking about either, but uh, yeah, definitely a normal user. Supply an argument that matches this. Yeah, okay. I don't know about you guys, but I don't read regular expressions. You can, and that's what I'm going to show next. You could do the help. Now, I don't use the help in parameters because what I've done, I've queried all the native ones, and there's like almost, they never use those. So that tells me that normal users probably don't know to look for that help. A simpler way is just to return a meaningful error message. And that's when I, I write my own and use validate script. I use the same regular expression. Very similar code. The one thing that this allows me to do is return a meaningful error message, which you can see here. But at that point in time, you're asking for a user's input. And I'm just using file name as an example. Probably you would have them put a path in and you would do like test path on an existing file name. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, typically what you want to do, at least from a best practices standpoint, you don't want to validate, you don't want to validate input inside the function. You don't want to allow it to get that far. You want to validate input at the parameter and say, nope. I mean, to me, why allow your script to continue any further than it has to? If, uh, if the user doesn't provide valid input, and the other thing, by using the parameter validation that's built in, now it is a custom script, so it's really not a lot of difference in that scenario. But one of the reasons I use parameter validation is my validation that I write is going to be very similar to anybody in this room. So it's kind of standardized. And certainly, if somebody has a different way of doing things, please speak up because there's been things that I do certain ways that I have changed based on knowledge from other people because I certainly can't think of everything. I think I already ran that. Okay, so now you get this message. It's either not a valid file name or it's not recommended. So you can read it. And usually you're not going to write a lot of code in there anyway. If I scroll up just a hair. So it's very simple. It's just validate script. It says, hey, if it matches this, then true. And if it doesn't, then throw an error. What I'm, and what I'm... What I'm curious, and it relates to the other gentleman's question, is something I have not tried, is can I call that other helper function from this? Yes. Oh, you can? So that may be the other option, is just call your other script from here. So that way your code is a helper function. So enumerations are another way to validate to validate input. So if I if I run this, it's going to return all the colors. So if I provide it with a couple of colors, it's going to say, "Hey, yeah, those are valid." Maybe I want to use pink. Sorry, can't use pink. So it's got to be a valid value inside the enumeration to be able to use it. And the only thing I've, uh, I've done is, is used it right here, use the uh, enumeration as a uh, value or as parameter validation. It's very similar to using a type constraint. All 
Okay, so how do you find enumerations? That's a question I always get. You can run this command here, which is, seems to be a really complicated one-liner. It'll give you a list of all the enumerations. An easier way is to, uh, Warren Frame wrote a command called get type that you can find in the uh, TechNet script repository. I've actually added it to my Mr. Toolkit uh, module. It's still got Warren's name in it, so he still gets credit, but you can run that command and it returns all the enumerations. So an example is the ones for the days of the week. It's probably an easier way to get the ones for the days of the week. So the other thing is type accelerators. How much code have you seen people write to validate IP addresses? And it may not be a lot of code, but how complicated code have they written? Maybe a super complicated regular expression. Okay, find the mouse. So is this valid? It is. Is this valid? It's not. And the good thing is, for this little thing, IP address, that's it. That's all the code I wrote, and I can validate IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So, hey, IPv6 valid, IPv6 not valid. Now, earlier, I added some code, and I imported my uh, Mr. Toolkit module at this point, and I got different output from that command. And I'm like, what? But it's because I have the same function in that toolkit, and it's different. Is that prejudice against string, like quotations? Oh, well, that one would be not valid anyway. I think it'll, it'll allow strings. Yeah. You can validate. There's one for email addresses also. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to show how to how you, how to get all those also. So, so I'm going to open up the one that I had earlier. So this is one. This was another one I wrote because the output I showed you is probably not the real really the output you want. So I'll just go ahead and load this function so it'll be the last one loaded and it will win when I run it. So now if I run this command. That's more like the output you would want. Hey, true, false, true, false. Yeah, so everybody always asks, how do you find the type accelerators? Well, with this command, but there's an easier way. I think it's called mail address. Yeah, there it is. So, mail address. And it works really well, I've tested it. An easier way, if you have the PowerShell Community Extensions, which is written by a PowerShell MVP by the name of Keith Hill, and Keith works on VS Code a lot, so uh, he's contributed to that. But you can run this command. <coughs> now what I will tell you is, if you have the PowerShell Community Extensions installed, if you haven't previously run a command in there, this won't trigger auto-loading is what I'm getting at. So you have to import the module before you can actually run that command. I kind of found that the hard way. It's like, why is this not working? And it's kind of like uh, PS drives. They're not there automatically. They don't auto-load. So we're down to about 40 minutes. Multiple parameter sets. This is something I find that not a lot of people do. Sometimes I do it one way versus the other, but and I'm going to base it off what David said. Is you should probably use the import them and use the fully qualified name because maybe you have like the VMware module and the Hyper-V module, and maybe they have some of the same commands, and you want to make sure you're loading the right one. The reason that I, I loaded it a lot manually because I have my modules in my GitHub folder instead of in, that I'm developing, 
instead of my PS module path. So I import them because I want to make sure I'm controlling when they're imported. If you're doing remoting auto load, that means you're going to be good. Really? And I, I could see that. But yeah, it's probably best to, I would say, to always be more declarative, to be very specific. That way you know you're going to get the results you expect. To be explicit. Okay, so we're going to create a function with multiple parameter sets. And this is, this is a little code snippet from one of my DSC functions. So I've got a name parameter, I've got a module parameter, and a path parameter. I want name and module to be available in separate parameter sets. So let's take a look at the syntax. I've got two parameter sets. If I call one, I just have it return the name of the parameter set. If I call the other one, that works too. The problem, at least right now, is positional binding does not work. And I've actually told it what the default parameter set is. So you can see the default parameter set is name. Not used to using the tra trackpad on this laptop. Have a docking station at work. It's the other thing. To be productive, I like to have three monitors. So. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I use this ISC steroids. And I'm, I know other products do this, but I break out the, the uh, output pane on a separate monitor. And that's one of the reasons I still like this, because you can't do that in VS Code. And it gives me more room to write code, you know. It's just a personal preference. But I do use VS Code. So, and while I'm talking about VS Code, I'll, I'll get back to, the, to this. This is what my VS Code environment looks like. And I have a video on configuring it this way. It's on my blog. Oh, and I'll, one more thing. I don't think I ran this earlier, but let's go ahead and run this. And I know this font's really small, but notice I actually have my VS Code defaulting to PowerShell Core. So I run stuff in the ISC and use Windows PowerShell, and I run it via VS Code, and I'll use PowerShell Core. And if you're interested in that, the, uh, it's all done in the configuration. I noticed this morning I still had 6.01 referenced, so when I opened it up, I had an issue, but I had to update that. Okay, so what I, the problem we, we have is uh, posi positional binding is not working. So what I found, even though I set a default parameter name set, I have to set a parameter in position zero for it to be positional. So if I look at the syntax now, and all you guys should know what this means in this room, so I've got square brackets around name, which means name is optional. But the entire parameter is not optional because the entire thing is not in square brackets. And module, of course, you can't have module and name both positional because it wouldn't know which one. But if you use module, you have to specify module. So now notice I'm going to call uh, the command with, without the name parameter, and it's going to work positionally. There's a little bit bigger problem that I found, or some mis a little misconception. Let's do this. So I want you to notice here, so what I've specified, I've seen a lot of people do this. So I specified parameter set, name, then module, and I specified parameter again with all the different options that I want to be the same in both of those. And this might, it may initially appear to work, but it doesn't work properly. And it's because you, well, I'll, I'll get to why it doesn't work. If I can select this with it. There we go. So 
So notice path is in position one now. So I can pipe something in. I can pipe in the path. Hey, it works great. I can look at help for that parameter. Hey, I can pipe in by value and by property name. That's, that must be a win. Well, the problem is, and in both the parameter sets for path, it actually shows value from pipeline and by property name is false when you drill down into it. So how's that? What's the deal? It's because I didn't read the instructions. I didn't read the help topic. So if you're going to specify all the same options in both your parameter sets for the path parameter, there's no reason to specify a parameter more than one time. Just say parameter and specify what you want and say that's it. It'll be available in both with all the options. So the only one, I'm going to skip these first two and run this last one. Because the first two is going to return the same thing as before. So what I want you to notice is now they're available by property name and by, by value. I hate the word by value. To me, it's by type. It should be by type and by property name because by value actually binds by type. So what if I want different options for path? So what you should do is be explicit. Notice the square brackets opens here and it closes here, and that's for name. And then I'm explicit again for module. So I have to specify the options that I want in each one of these blocks for that parameter na name. And it works perfect. It's one of those things when you search the internet on how to do something instead of figuring it out for yourself. Let's do this. Make our life easy. Oh, we can get the close one. And we'll just run the last one. So I specified different options. That's what I'm trying to show you here. So you'll notice with one of the parameter sets, it's, it, it can come in by, by value and by property name. And I thought I had different ones. Maybe not. Oh, did I? Okay. Thank you. Thought I ran the entire thing. One more time. After this, I have a couple things I definitely want to cover that's not very intuitive. Here we are. Okay, so the bottom one is false. One of the options, you got true false and you got true true. So that's how you get different options. And it works perfectly. Because until you drill down into these commands, you can't see that there's a problem. I think we're going to come back to, well, let's see, we've got about 30 minutes. I'm going to come back to the return keyword because that's totally separate but I'll just cover it real briefly, is return is probably the most overused command in PowerShell. And it can cause you a lot of pain too because when used inappropriately, it will actually exit out of a loop and not return all the values that would normally be returned. Now, when you're using classes, you need return. You have to use return in classes. I do want to show you this real quick. I can't leave you hanging. 
So in PowerShell 4, I wrote a new Mr. GUID function because with DSC, there was no new, new GUID command. So I'll use return, say, hey, it looks great. So what's the big deal? You can get the same results by just calling the variable. That's not really how I like to do it, though. How I like to write my commands is to use write output. And it's going to be the same output. The problem is it's not always the same. And there's, there's really no reason to uh, store it in a variable and call the variable anyway. You could just output the value. Cut to the chase. So this one, I'm not using return. So without the return keyword, it returns any greater number than four is returned. So notice that, five, seven, nine. Same code. I'm going to add return. Who knows what's going to happen? There you go. So you guys know this. So that's why you, if you're in the habit of using return and you use return all the time, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. So, and I'll just show you that real quick. So I want to make sure we, so it's going to return five and then that's it. It exits, exits the loop. Now I've kind of got the same sort of thing going on here. It shouldn't take very long. So we just use a range operator and give it one through 10. And notice the total of seven items were returned. So we add return. I have a detailed blog article on this as well. So now when I run it with return, guess what? We don't get the verbose output. First value, that's it. So. Should we ever use it? You should use it in classes. And if you understand how to use it, then yes. Because you may want the functionality I just showed you. You may want to grab the first value and then that's it. Just to understand how it works. And the, the, uh, the help topic for return is really good. I've got a link. Well, I believe I have a link in here. So what if I run this? Oh yeah, so I've got all the, all the links I have in here go to the PowerShell core help topics. And I cut the version off the end of it because that way it'll go to the latest version even if you look at this in a couple of years and it, they've got version 14 out. So verbose output, you guys probably know how to do this, but I've got inline comments. So if you're doing something like return, you might want in, inline comments. But nobody's ever going to see this. And from what I found, people will go update the code and they'll never update those comments. So I would rather have no comments than comments that are wrong. So when I run that with a verbose parameter, sorry, can't see it. Same command except I've used right verbose. You call it without verbose, you don't get it. You call it with verbose, you get it. So that's it for right verbose. Pipeline input. Oh, what fun. So we're, we've got about 25 minutes. Okay, so what we're doing here, what we've added, we've, we've made a parameter mandatory and we're accepting pipeline input by, by type. They call it by value, but it's really by type. It's gonna, if I pipe a string into this, it's gonna bind to the string. And that's why you can't have value from pipeline on two different strings. And if I pipe these to get member, of course, if I scrolled up, you guys know that those are strings. 
server one and server two. It's pretty self-explanatory. So what I'm going to do now is create a custom object that's got a name of computer name. And it would show PS custom object if I piped it to get member. When you pipe it in, some older versions of PowerShell would actually give you an error, but newer versions just give you some output that you don't want. So now let's try by property name. One thing that, well, and I, I have another script to run. So now I'm going to try to pipe my strings in, and guess what? Nope. We don't accept pipeline input by, by type. But if I pipe the custom objects in, they work just fine. And also be aware that syntax I was using is version 3. Well, actually, the mandatory would be equal true if it was version 2, but the value from pipeline, I don't remember if it had true on it or not. But anyway, I quit writing to version 2 since it's deprecated. I do have one box with version 2 on it. All, my, all the boxes in my environment have 5.1 except for the Exchange server. <laughs> don't touch it. It's running Exchange 2010, but we're in the process of, uh, it's in hybrid mode. We're going to Office 365. So what I have done here, and see there it is again, somebody wins a book. I've allowed value by pipeline, by type, and by property name. So I can pipe in my strings. I can pipe in my custom object. And hey, it works either way. But one thing to note with this is it's always going to try by value or by type, as I call it, first. It'll only try to bind by property name if by type doesn't work. I think Don, in his book, he called it Plan A and Plan B. So one thing that trips a lot of people up is the values you pipe in are not available in the begin block. So notice it should say test and output the computer name. It's only going to say test because you can't access those values in the begin block. So let's get cover error handling real quick. I think Jeffrey Snover covered this a little bit yesterday. There's something very specific I want to cover. So I have a function that has no error handling. I try to query a computer name that doesn't exist, and I get an error message. It's an unhandled exception. So the only thing I'm going to do to this, try catch is what you add for error handling. So notice when I'm calling test WS man, I have it inside the try block. A catch block, so with try catch, a lot of people think, oh, I have to have a try block, I have to have a catch block. That's actually not true. You have to have a try block, and you either have to have a catch block or a finally block. But you can have all three. But to me, I always have a catch block. I guess why, that's why people make that assumption. But guess what? It's not going to work. So still get an unhandled exception. And why do I get an unhandled exception? Because it's not a terminating error. So I've said, uh, I've added error action stop to this. So one of the common questions is, what do I do if I'm running a DOS command or something in .NET, it doesn't have error action uh, parameter on it? So there's an error action preference variable. And what you can do is immediate, where I, immediately before you call the command, change the error action preference, and then call the command, and then change it back. But what you need to do is actually store the error action preference variable value in another variable because the default is continue, 
but something else could have changed it from continue to something else. So you want to make sure you get it back to what it was originally after your command runs. So don't make assumptions. Really? So the comment is, that's a good place to, to uh, set it back in the finally block. And I've never thought about that, but that is a good idea. I don't know why David didn't raise his hand when uh, I asked for PowerShell experts, or maybe he did and I didn't notice. I mean, this is actually, free, so you guys know, he actually, he's the guy that writes the code. He wrote PowerShell Studio. So now when I call it, I'll get a, so I gave a warning instead of an error. It's so much nicer. So we've got a little over 15 minutes left. My alarm's about to go off, so nobody panic. It's not a fire alarm. Comment-based help. I've got long-lived comment-based help, and comment-based help is dead because I've been looking at MAML, but I talked some, to some other MVPs. I was at the MVP Summit last month here in, in uh, Seattle. And although Platypus is available and there's a session this week you should check out, I'm not sold on a mammal-based help, especially after what I heard yesterday. And what most MVPs said, for the code they're writing, what I've been told in the past, and I still hold this as valid, is if I'm going to write something to sell, I'm probably going to create mammal-based help. What mammal-based help gives you is multiple cultures, so different languages, help for different languages, and updatable help. That's the two things that buys you. But most MVPs that I talked to, they said, with the code I write, if I need to update my help, I'll just publish another version of my module, a minor version. And the other thing is, uh, they said, I wouldn't attempt to write it in different cultures, you know, especially to people like, like me. I only speak one language, so I don't think I'd trust Google, Google Translate. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to skip over those sections. So a script module. How do you create a script module? If you ran help new module, you would find out, as I previously said, that creates, that creates dynamic modules in memory. There's no command for creating a module. It's called new item. So I'm going to create a folder and a file, a PS1 file. So your script module is, resides in a PSM1 file. I'm going to inject a couple of simple functions into that file. And open it up. Let's close these out. I was glad to see yesterday they mentioned there's a command similar to PS Edit in VS Code. So that's one of the thing, pieces of the puzzle I was missing. So I try to call the command, hey, it doesn't exist. What's the deal? So yeah, so that's the alarm to let me know that John, Don Jones is going to show up in five minutes. I did not. Uh, so anyway, you see where it resides at. It's not in the PS module path is the problem. So I would have had to import it explicitly or put it somewhere in the PS module path. So the PS module path and let's see, we got a few minutes. So it's pretty easy to get the PS module path. You guys probably already know this. I had the AWS command looks loaded, so I have one extra value here. I want to talk about these real quick because these can be confusing. Just clear the screen before we uh, do this. Okay, so the first one, I never use this. Why? Because that's not my my documents. I have three Active Directory users. One, I'm a standard user on my desktop. I'm a standard user in the domain. 
Number two, I'm an admin user on my desktop, standard user in the domain. And number three, I'm an admin on my desktop and an admin in the domain. So I log in as a standard user. And then I run PowerShell as an admin, so it's a different user. So Mike F. Robbins is not the user I'm logged into the box as, so if I go to my documents, it's not there. Now that's one th change I've made with VS Code. I run VS Code as a standard user. And then I actually, if I need to test as an admin, really you only need to run PowerShell as an admin if you're doing something that requires UAC elevation on the local box. If you're running stuff against a remote box, then UAC doesn't come into play anyway. Um, so the second path, this was added in PowerShell 4. This is where you should put, this is the all users path. And typically what I would recommend is put all your mo production modules in here that are user created. And this is where uh, the PS gallery installs by default unless you give it scope of, of user. <coughs> Say that again. Yes, and that, I guess that is one reason to run this as an admin, because you would, the, and see the problem with that, I have another problem because the user I'm logged into Windows doesn't have access to that user's, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. It's okay. Uh, it's not something I do or I've really thought about. Uh, you would, it would just be a dependency that you would have to validate. That would be my main concern is having a dependency. It's not there by default, but it's no different than the AWS module. You know? So I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. If it's a standard in your company, I believe in consistency. So if that's your standard, set it as a standard and stick with it. So the, uh, the Windows folder, the System32, you'll read some of the outdated documentation that tells you to put modules in here. That is false. I've been told by a member of the PowerShell team, or multiple members of the PowerShell team, you should never put anything here unless you're Microsoft. Now, I think the uh, old documentation was before this all users path existed. And I'm curious to know, you can install the PowerShell gallery on PowerShell 3 and 4. And I'm curious to know if you install the PowerShell get module on PowerShell 3, how does it handle the all users or does it create this? Because that didn't exist in PowerShell 3. The one thing that can trip you up on this is the PS auto loading preference, which has no value by default. I changed this once upon a time to none because I wanted to go back to the functionality in version two, well, yeah, it doesn't work that way. If you set it to none, it means none. No core modules, no nothing. You have to import everything. So if you run into trouble with auto-loading auto and you know your module's in the right place, you might want to double check this. And if you're, if you're like David and you want to always module qualify, you could, uh, you could set it to that. Okay, module manifest. Oh, we need to move this. This trackpad is killing me. Okay, so we moved it in the PS module path. Didn't do anything else. No importing, no nothing. Just copied it. Guess what? Now it works. So I do like that functionality. But you may not get what you think you're getting. There's an order of precedence too with aliases and functions and commandlets. I know that Jeffrey Snover, I think he, he talked about that in his unplugged demo at Ignite last year, and that was really interesting. So if you, if you run get module and you see a module at 0, 0.0, it's a dead giveaway that that module probably does not have a manifest because I don't know of anybody who would publish a module at 0.0. .0. I heard a talk one time from Lee Holmes who said all modules should always have manifest. 
and it's metadata about your module. So we're gonna create a new manifest. And what I've used here, you guys probably know, I've used flatting because it's a really long line. I don't wanna use the uh, backtick as line continuation. It's not exactly, I don't think that's what splatting was designed for, but it works well as that. I think it was designed so you could uh, dynamically allocate your parameters. Like if you have a credential parameter, you can add it to a, uh, you can add it to a hash table if it's specified, but not if it's not specified. You can check the PS bound parameters. So I've got a little snippet here about line continuation. And I think I'm gonna skip that because I think I've talked about that enough. There's a plaster uh, session this week. I am gonna cover plaster real quick. This is kind of getting toward the end of the demo. So you can install it from the PowerShell gallery. I have a detailed blog article that I wrote recently about this. A lot of my recent blog articles were building up to this session. I was like, I don't have time to blog in and work on this session. So what I've done here, I've actually created, I've created the information that's required for a plaster template and I've stored it in hash tables and I'm gonna splat that also. I'll open up the XML file that I just created. So that's what it looks like. It's got my metadata basically in it. And that's metadata about the plaster template, not about the uh, modules. I'm gonna create a PS1 file that's gonna be used for every one of my script modules. It's gonna dot source the PS1 files. I'm gonna open that up. So I use something like this on every one of my script modules because I put my functions in PS1 files, so when I put it on GitHub, it's really easy for somebody to grab one function. Uh, there is a link in this slide deck from, from a MVP from Europe, who I saw do something last week that I'm really interested in. I like this for GitHub and for development, but I would prefer my functions to be all in the PS1 file when I put them on the PowerShell gallery for production. He's written some code to put it all back together and do unit tests and all that sort of stuff on it. So the uh, plaster, does plaster does that? Okay. I did not know that. I'm actually a newbie with plaster. What I did, I used to have a function that created my script modules and functions and it was very specific to me. And what I decided to do was translate that exact functionality to plaster to reduce the learning curve. So what I'm gonna do now is actually update the plaster template with the information that I, I wanna add to all my modules. And it's not that one, it's this one. So you can see here in all my modules, I'm, I've got parameters here and I've provided some default values. It's gonna want the module author's name and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then it's gonna prompt me, well, no, it's not gonna prompt, it's gonna replace this with some of that parameter information. <coughs> Excuse me, keep forgetting about the microphone. Yep, one more time. So what I'm gonna do now is create create a script module. So I have to give it this information, so I'm giving it all the paths. Now what I would recommend when you create your script modules, the only thing that's required, I believe, is the path, but from what I've found, if you don't give it a root module, your module won't do anything. Now I've found, I've actually seen some with DSC that doesn't require a root module, and I haven't figured that out yet, why it works. But for the most part, you always have to have a root module the other thing I would recommend specifying is the description and the, uh, the author, because if you're gonna put it in PowerShell Gallery, those are required. Actually, if you're gonna put it in a NuGet repository with PowerShell Get, those are required, because they, they run test module manifest against those. And we didn't run this yet. we ran this. Okay. 
okay? So, and I use the verbose parameter if you have any problems that can give you additional information. So you'll see where it's located at now. It's my demo folder. Uh, that's my plaster template there. I should have had that moved up in my demo a little bit because I just created the, uh, the module. Okay, there's a session on PS Script Analyzer this week. So if we got just a minute to cover the format data. So that's the last thing on the list of what I said I would do that I haven't done. So notice the last thing on this, this is pretty standard function, but free space is the very last thing. I have to add this to my functions to export. So I wrote a pester test, I can actually test it and see if it exists, and it does. Update the module manifest to add the uh, XML file. Make sure that they still exist. Let's re-import the function. Let's call the, the function before we re-import it. Maybe I have to re-import it. Thought I had already imported it once. What I want you to notice is, so this is in a list. I don't really want a list. So we all know that, hey, if it's four properties or less, it's in a table, and if it's, if it's more than four properties, it's in a list. So what I've done here, I've added one line to this, the very bottom line. I've added this type information. Instead of being a PS custom object, it's going to be a Mr. System Info. I need an XML file that's going to specify the ones that are going to be listed in the table. We will get there. I actually have to update the module manifest to tell it about the formats to process file. I'll re-import the module. And when I run it this time, I'll get, I'll get a table. Now the other thing you're gonna, you can do, and the code is here if you wanna see it. Let's see. So we've got like one minute. One last thing. You can always do one more thing. It's like you tell your wife, you know, or your husband, just five more minutes. And you're like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, you know, on the computer. So now what we're going to do, we're actually going to add a type file because I don't want my output in bytes and all that sort of stuff. We can run all that. So we'll add the type file to the module manifest. We'll import the module again. We'll run the command. Guess what? Now we've got it in usable values. But the thing that this buys you is those original byte values still exist in case you want to use them down the road. So if I... <laughs> yep, I know. So notice I've got size and longer values. And that's the last thing I want to show there. I am going to jump back to the slide deck real quick. And I really want the last slide. Well, we, we need this slide. We can't leave without seeing Jason again. So when you get through and you've written great code, then six months later, you'll be the guy drinking margaritas instead of trying to gouge your eyes out. So I've got some resources in the slide deck, and that's the last slide. Those are all the books I've participated in. This is the one that all you guys got a copy of. If you want my email address, go out to my uh, About page and decode it. It's encoded. Thank you.